Your presenters for today are Bruce Brotherson from Volcraft and Walt Worsley from Valley Joist. Some of the learning objectives for today's webinar will include identify the key characteristics of in-place joists, teach you how to determine who the original manufacturer was and whether they can provide any additional documentation, show you how to verify the original design loads and evaluate the joists for the new loads. And finally, as part of the evaluation, procedures will be discussed to identify the joist components and connections that are inadequate. We will now begin the webinar, and I'm going to transfer controls over to Bruce. Welcome, everyone. We're glad that you can spend a few minutes with us today. Uh, we'll be, as, as Patty mentioned, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, joists, and as, as part of an introduction, Commercial manufacturing of joists began in 1923, and the Steel Joist Institute was formed in 1928. Uh, and there are millions of open web steel joists in service today. Consequently, on occasion, some need to be reviewed and, and evaluated and modified. There is a, uh, the latest specification it was, was written in 2015. We kind of call that the unified spec, but in that there's K series joists, LH and DL, DLH series joists, and joist girders. Today we're going to talk about um, evaluation and modification of joists, uh, and those and the reasons that joists may be need to be evaluated and modified are, are uh, building renovations or addition or larger roof top units, conveyor loads. Uh, things happen in the field that are a little different than what was planned for on the, on the drawings. Other changes that, that we don't even know about when we, when we do the original design. And then damage of joists. And damage of joists is probably um, one of the more common things to, uh, to repair. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. The Steel Joist Institute has a technical digest number 12, and that, that uh, digest is, is titled Evaluation and Modification of Open Web Steel Joists and Joist Girders. Uh, it's a great resource for, for your library. Uh, in that, we have, um, we have procedures and, and also some details for modification or strengthening of joists. That uh, publication is $30, and you can order that at uh, steeljoist.org. Uh, in, the, in the publication, in this technical digest, uh, I've shown a table of contents. So today we're gonna go through essentially chapter one and two. Uh, next month, we have a webinar. Um, in in the, the third Wednesday of November, where we'll go through some of these other things as far as strengthening and modifying joists. So um, this is this uh, webinar is really a two-part series of what the Technical Digest talks about. Uh, one of the first things we have there is a glossary of terms. And with every industry, we have uh, terms that we use in the industry which are specific to the industry. And so uh, as joists, are being discussed, sometimes it's really helpful to know what those terms are. And so we have that at the beginning of the, uh, of the technical digest. Things like, things that are kind of specific to, um, to Joyce, you know, or things like the tagged end uh, and the webs. And so as we talk through this, if there's a, it's a term that you may not understand, um, if you go to that glossary, you'll have a better understanding of what uh, of what those terms specifically mean for in the joist industry. Um, kind of as a, um, kind of what we, we talk about, kind of the typical things that we talk about when we talk about joists are, uh, are the spans, uh, also the top cord, obviously that's the, that's the top portion of the cord that can either be uh, parallel to the bottom or, or pitched or double pitched or even um, even you know even rolled cords uh, every, all of those are called the top cords the bottom cord and then the webs tie the two cords together the joist depth is from the outside of the top cord to the outside of the bottom cord 
uh, on one end of the joist, we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but on one end of the joist is called the tagged end and there will be the joist tag on that end. And that's gonna be real critical to, that, that tagged end is gonna be real, really critical to identifying that when we talk about how to evaluate joists. Uh, when you need to evaluate joists, there's, it, it, you know, every one of every one of these are kind of a one-off in, in a lot of cases. But the best option is if we can find the construction documents, either the contract are, drawings or the erection plan. Also, if we can find the joist tag, uh, that's going to be a that will have been attached to the joist when it was manufactured. Sometimes those are still attached. Sometimes they're not. Uh, and then with that, contact the joist manufacturer and see if they have some calculations. Uh, in most cases, the joist manufacturer will have some calculations and they'll provide those at a minimal cost, uh, essentially the cost to retrieve that information. And then we also need to uh, determine under what specification these joists were, were designed. So, um, so so joists that were designed prior to 2015 are going to be different than the joists that were designed after 2015 because of the changes in the specification. So that's that's one of the things that we really need to uh, identify as we're talking about joists. If you can't get that information, there's always a second option. Um, so if there's no contract drawings available, uh, there's no tag on the joist. Uh, then, then we need to know the project name and address. And these these things seem to change. I I was involved with a project uh, not too long ago, um, uh, and it was a um, it was a manufacturing facility for a Coca Cola bottling plant. Uh, and the name when we built the project didn't didn't have anything to do with Coca Cola. Of course, from that name, it, the the address was or the name of the job was the address. Um, and so um, sometimes it's kind of hard to find the names because the names change from, from one point to another. But so that's why it's good to have the project name and the address, specifically the city as well. And if you can't, if you're really having a tough time, um, the SJI provides a joist investigation form and you can fill that out and then also contact SJI for assistance. Uh, the evaluation, uh, when we look to evaluate of the existing joist strength, we need to determine the capacity of the existing joist system. So uh, as we mentioned, we need some as-built designs. We need some, perhaps some existing joists were possibly over-specified from what you're trying to, uh, for the loads that, what, that we're looking for now. Uh, you know, the building usage may have changed, so that's going to um, perhaps um, cause some additional evaluation, and then sometimes the joists get damaged. Uh, an example of that is that not too long ago, I was involved with a project where a building was built next to it, and the existing building needed to, was going to be subject to drift loading of snow, and so and so we had to uh, evaluate those joists uh, and and modify those the, the existing joists because the loads had changed from from uh, drifting snow. So if we uh, when we talk about as built for the joists, we need to determine the original contract or structural documents, find the joist direction plan, also the year that the project was built. Uh, those joist identification tags are really important. And then um, if, if we're having trouble, we may have to do some field investigation and measurement. So kind of the, the difference between a structural plan and an erection plan is the structural plan will have the designation. If you see that uh, plan there on the left, the designation is uh, 20K4 and 16K3s. Also has the joist Facing. On the erection plan, there's the designation, in this case, a 16K4. There's also joist spacing, and then that important joist mark number. Uh, that joist mark number identifies that piece. So 
um, so that similar pieces would be have different mark numbers, but we'll be able to tell the difference between those based on the mark numbers. And that's the way the Joyce folks keep track of their calculations and so forth. So the Joyce tag, or the Joyce, yeah, the Joyce tag is normally found on the end web. So as you can see on these, on in these uh, photographs, uh, the Joyce tag is just attached to the end web, and on that Joyce tag, there's some information. Uh, and essentially, there's three pieces of information on the Joyce tag. Uh, the Joyce manufacturer's name, in this case, it's Volcraft Utah. Um, the Joyce manufacturer's job number, and in this case, it's 7480124, and then the mark number, in this case, G100. And so um, that's really, that's about all the information that you need for the Joyce manufacturer to go into their archives and figure out what, you know, what the as-built information was. So that's really, that's really good information to have. And it's, and it's all right there on the Joyce tag if you can get a hold of the Joyce tag. If if you don't, then here's this uh, Joyce investigation form that I mentioned earlier, and the SGI can help you with that. It, it's uh, you can download that and then fill this out completely, and then send it back to the SGI, and those folks can uh, those folks can get this can kind of figure out where this Joyce might be. Quite often, I uh, uh, get requests from the SGI to see if there's a, to see if in our archives we can find a project. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, but uh, that's probably the easiest way to get information on a joist is to have the joist manufacturer find that information for you. Uh, when we're doing field investigation, if you if if you don't have if you don't have any information and you know, if, the, if you're looking at joists that were built maybe in the 50s or 60s, um, probably you're not going to have information. So in that particular case, um, it's really helpful to find the loading of the joists if possible, information from the tags, the joist configurations, measure those out and figure out how those webs are, are uh, you know, what the distances are be between those webs and the panel points, the joist span, the joist spacing, of course, the joist depth, and then the bearing conditions, whether it's underslung or bottom cord bearing. And in the next slide, we got a illustration that shows what a bottom bottom cord bearing joist is. Essentially, the bottom cord is extended and the joist bears on its support point on the bottom cord. And an underslung joist is what's typically done. And in that case, there's a bearing seat placed on the top cord, and then the bottom cord hangs lower than the support point. With a field investigation, we kind of need to know how these joists were built, what the, what they look like, and what the what the materials were used. And so, for web members, um, the web members can be either rods, uh, crimped angles, angles welded to the outsides of cords, and cold form sections. Also, take note of what the end diagonal pipe. That end diagonal pipe may be different than what the interior webs are. Any eccentricities. Also, weld sizes and lengths and, and welded connections are designed for the design requirements, the force in that member when, uh, when it was designed, and not for the overall strength of the member. And then also the panel point spacing or the, or the way that the uh, webs line up on the joist. So typically, most manufacturers uh, in the, we'll call it in the modern era, most of the manufacturers build joists with with angle shapes, either either uh, cold formed or hot rolled, and there is a gap between the between the cords, and in that gap, quite often, if possible, we like to stick the webs, and it makes it easier to weld. So these two um, photographs show rod webs. Um, they're typically bent and then placed in between the cords. Crimped webs are an angle that is crimped to the distance between the cord. Uh, 
um, in this case, uh, about an inch. Most most manufacturers build their build their joists for their crimp webs at an inch, and so their the ends are smashed or crimped, and then they go in between the cords. And you, you can see on the picture on the left, there's also a end or uh, the end web is a rod. So in this particular case, we got crimp webs and and rods on the same joist. Uh, also, we'll have angle webs welded to the outside of the cords. You can see that in this in these um, in these photographs. Uh, when we talk about eccentricity, that quite often um, the thing to most be worried about is if there's eccentricity in the uh, at the bearing condition. And so that's something we always like to look at to make sure make sure that uh, the joist is acting as it is intended. Generally. In almost all cases, the joist would be designed so that there would be no eccentricity or the work point between the end rod and the top cord would be placed over the bearing support. Um, we talk about weld locations. Where are those welds located? Uh, in cases where the webs are between the cords, uh, the webs are welded in between the cords uh, welded to the um, cord on both sides of the web and, and these dark lines indicate where those welds would be. Uh, when we talk about welded connections, the weld sizes or lengths are designed for the original design requirement, as I mentioned before, and not for the overall strength of the member. And so, um, Let's say, for example, a, a compression web was only designed for 50% of the tension, allowable tension force in the member. Um, in that particular case, the we would only put that amount of weld on the joist and not for the full capacity of the tension member. One thing also to keep in mind if we're trying to figure out what kind of webs go in what kind of joist um so for short for k series joists only rod webs are rod interior webs are placed in k series joists for crimped webs they can also they can be in all types of joists whether they're short span long span or joist girders and then double angle webs are typically in the uh longer or heavily loaded lh or dlh series joists and in joist girders So when we're looking at a field investigation, we need to look at the type of cord members. Um, just verify that they're double angles, uh, you know, and the separation distance between the two cords, whether there's fillers or ties in between the angles, whether they're, whether cold form sections are used. Uh, in old joists, you know, sometimes um, rods were used for the, for the bottom cord. And then whether there's any splices in those, whether they're what we would call a, a uh, shop splice, which means they're welded together to um, extend the piece, or if they're field splices, which means they would be a bolted condition where two halves of the joist would be bolted together. So those are the types of things that we need to know. Um, also, the bridging, making sure that there's bridging there uh, and what type of bridging. Also, the uh, quality of the bridging connections. Bridging doesn't doesn't provide much support if it's not uh, connected properly. Also, that there's anchorage of the bridging, and um, sometimes we need to understand. I mean, sometimes we need to go and and understand what materials being used. And if we don't know, taking a small uh, coupon out of the uh, out of the material, we can figure out what the what the strength is, and then also looking at the conditions of the joist and the existing deck, making sure that it's not overly rusted or or um, or if there's any problems associated with that. So when we talk about bridging, there's really three kinds of bridging. Um, there's bolted uh, erection stability bridging. That bridging uh is required before the joist is released from the hoisting cable so that pro provides lateral support during the construction process also horizontal bridging which provides lateral 
stability to the joist and or the bottom court, um, both during construction and during, um, during service of the joist. And then uplift bridging, which is a horizontal piece located at the first bottom court panel point of the joist, and that provides stability for the joist of that panel point in the joist when the bottom cord goes into up when goes into compression during an uplift condition. Um, what we what we have here is a what we call the 85 year steel joist manual, uh, and in this manual we have the specifications, all of the joist specifications from 1928 to 2002, and in and what that allows us to do is if we've got a joist that we know is built under an older specification, we can go back and understand uh, what the capacity of that joist was based on, based on that older specification. In the 85-year digest, uh, there's, a, there's some points that uh, are made with regard to investigation of joists in existing buildings. Uh, first, uh, the first point is that uh, we need to be careful because of the safety of the humans that are going to occupy the building. Second, um, the task of investigating steel joists in an existing building is difficult. And at best, personal time, effort, and patience are all required to conduct a proper study. Um, yeah, it takes a little bit of effort. And, and there's probably going to be some assumptions and so we've got to be careful of that. And so that's what we talk about in, in, in the third item there. Make as few assumptions as possible. Verify actual observed and physical measurements in the data. Um, look at unusual and or dangerous job site conditions. Uh, and then double check all data. Make sure that we've got everything that we need and, and all the information is, is appropriate. And because we're going to make some design assumptions based on that. Okay, I threw these slides in here just as uh, an example. This came across my desk uh, a couple weeks ago. And as you can see, some joists got damaged during handling. And, and there's a number of things that happened here. Not sure why or how, but you can see all of these, all of these things are going to require some repair if this joist is going to be used. Um, so in this case, uh, you can see that the webs have been, have been bent. Certainly, that's something that can be either that can be repaired. Also, the top cord. You can see that the top cord is has been um, has been damaged. Um, definitely, the joist will not act as it was originally intended with that kind of uh, damage in it. So that's going to have to be repaired. Uh, a little small ding in the bottom cord. Uh, that's a minor, you know, very minor thing that might. We may be able to uh, fix that just by cold bending that back into place. And then also the um, also that web on the right, you can see that's been failed out of plane. And so that web definitely is going to have to be fixed, uh, either replaced or uh, a significant um, repair is going to have to happen to, to get that joist to where we need it. Um, here's here's that uh, here's all of those things, and they all happen right about in the same spot. Um, so you can tell that something was going on there as those joists were being handled, and and in this particular case, because of that, we probably also need to make sure that we do an inspection of the welds, make sure that none of the welds are damaged or or cracked, uh, not just the members, but those connections are extremely important. Uh, here's some more common things, I want to say common, but not uncommon, unfortunately. You can see here we're, we're uh, uh, doing a core through the slab, hit the joist, top core of the joist. Uh, here in this particular location, they're doing a, they're doing a, a core and, and cut through, nearly almost all the way cut through the end diagonal of the joist. Obviously, that's going to need to be fixed. Uh, here again, we've got some uh, damage associated with coring through a coring through a uh, a wall, hitting some hitting an end diagonal, uh, and in this case, you can see this this uh, 
particular condition was in a it was in a building that was in operation and the boom of a forklift went up the operator put the boom all the way up and uh, hit the bottom cord of the joist and obviously that's going to need to be repaired for that joist to function as it was intended occasionally we'll get run into problems where somebody feels like the uh, uh, the material that they have is more important than the joist and so in this particular case the the uh, that steel stud was was uh, placed and the joist and part of the joist was cut out obviously that's going to need to be fixed and then here's one of my favorite slides uh, obviously that joist was not used as it was the what the design intent was and obviously in that particular case um, if the joist was going to be evaluated it would be worth very little and it would need to be modified significantly uh, if to, to get it to carry the loads that it was intended you can see there that the bearing seat is is that the that the top cord is is down on the bottom and that and the and the bottom cords uh, are supporting the loads and obviously the joist was not designed for that condition um, when we do repairs um, OSHA has a requirement and it says no modification that affects the strength of the steel joist or joist girder shall be made without the approval of the project structural engineer of record uh, I think that's a good thing so that everybody knows what's going on on these projects and if something needs to be fixed that everybody is aware of what's going on so um, quite often an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and 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 we have a number of things that can can be used so that minor repairs uh, are not going to be needed. And the first one is the 100 pound rule. We'll talk about that. That's kind of a new thing in the joist business. Then add loads and bend loads. We actually call those bend checks. Um, and then KCS joist. So the 100 pound rule essentially says that joist can carry up to 100 pounds uh, in between the panel points. And so if that load if that 100 pounds is apply is is in the design designation uh, additional web, web members do not have to be placed to carry small loads like 100 pounds as long as the attachments are concentric to the cord um, concentrated loads in excess of 100 pounds or which do not meet the criteria outlined above must be applied at panel points or field strut members must be utilized as shown in the detail above. And in most structural drawings, there's a standard standard detail similar to this showing that that um, if there's a concentrated load, particularly on the bottom cord, uh, and also between panel points on the top cord, that additional load, that additional web members is is, re is required. One of the things that's really helpful uh, when we're doing an evaluation is having a load diagram, specifying the loads that, that are actually required for that joist. So in this particular case, uh, the uniform load is 300. Uh, that's the total load. And, and sometimes in the, uh, like in the uh, standard designation joist, that load, it may, you may know that it was a 300 pound load, but there may be uh the way that joist was designed there may be more capacity than the actual requirement and so looking at load diagrams getting that clear is a very important part of this is a very important part of what we're what we're doing also concentrated loads we need to make sure that we know the exact location of those concentrated loads so that we can design the joist appropriately um, Quite often, as in we, we've got a HVAC frame, uh, and those are applied at, uh, the loads are applied in four corners as, as the frame goes, is, is spanned between two joists. And you can see that sometimes those things move around a bit and we're always trying to figure out where they go. So we have what we call add loads. In this particular case, the add load, um, the add loads are placed on the joists and the add load can be placed um, 
so that the add load is, is involved as one concentrated load placed right in the middle of the joist so that it can, so that concentrated load uh, will design the top cord and bottom cord and then the and then the load will have a load combination where an, where that concentrated load is placed at the at each top cord panel point so that the webs are designed appropriately. As you can see on the on the animation that it's moving across the joist and that will be a number of different load cases so that the joist can be uh, designed so the webs can be designed appropriately for each one of those. The worst case for the cords is going to be in the center. And then for the webs, it will be right over the web. And if they're not applied at panel points, then we're going to need to have an additional web, web member placed. Same thing with the bottom cord. If the load, if we're not designing for that concentrated load, an additional web member will need to be placed. Now we have what we call a bend check load. And these bend checks, um, which on your, which I changed uh, just this morning on your, on your, um, on the presentation that was sent out is called a bend load. It's really a bend check and that's the appropriate uh, terminology because we're not adding a load, we're just checking for the load as a bending force between the panel points. And so that's what we can do so that we don't have to add those additional web, those additional web members. So in this case, the bend check is placed in between, or the bend check is made in between each of the uh, each of the panel points. So if that was a 500 pound concentrated load, the bend check would be 500 pounds placed in between the panel points on the joist, so that an additional web member was would not be required. We do the same thing on the bottom cord. So bend checks can be on the top cord or the bottom cord. Um, and so those additional web members are not needed when we have a bend check, so we don't need those. So in the code of standard practice in the specification, uh, we have some wording that is really good to help the joist manufacturers know how to use an add load and how to use the bend check load. So I won't go into that, but if you want to use that, go to standard practice and there's and there's this information that will help you with your notes so they're clear to the joist manufacturer. KCS joists are essentially joists uh, that have constant shear. And so in that particular case, the joist is designed, the top cord is designed for a uh, flat moment diagram and the webs, all of the webs are designed for, for shear for the same, for the for um, for the shear that um, that's in the joist, so they'll all be the same. So they'll all be the same size. So all webs are designed for vertical shear equal to the specified shear capacity, and the interior webs will be designed for 100% stress reversal. So there's an opportunity. If you don't know what your loads are, you're not sure what's going on, and you know that they're going to be significant, then specify a KCS joist, and then we don't have to worry about um, locating all of those point loads or you know loads from mechanical units or whatever. This is just an easy way so that we don't have to do an evaluation later. Um, and so just a couple points associated with the joist analysis. Um, we consider all of the connections to be pinned uh, and that's our assumption in the design of web members uh, for K-series joists in the 2015 spec has, has changed. So prior to 2015, bending in the K-series joists from uniformly applied loads was, was neglected, provided that the top cord panel spacing did not exceed 24 inches. That changed in 2015. The bending from the uniform applied loads are considered in all joists, K and LH, regardless of the panel spacing. However, the K factor in the slenderness ratio is 0.75 in 2015 and 1.0 prior. That's for the K series joist. So sometimes it's beneficial to uh, evaluate the joist 
in two different specifications and you may find that in you know one maybe in the original specification it didn't work but in the new specification it does obviously still doesn't know which specification it was designed under uh, so that's a good trick to have up your sleeve to try to minimize the repairs um, and then and then that last point consequence Consequently, a decision needs to be made regarding which spec to be used for the evaluation of the joint. Um, in our evaluation, it's a first order analysis. And then for, for rod, or I say SGI permits eccentricity to be neglected when for K series the three quarter rule is followed. That's in, the, that's, in, that's in the specification. And for other series, when the eccentricity does not exceed the distance between the centroid of the cord, centroid of the connections and the back of the cord. And here's an example of that. As you can see, the web members do not meet at a point, at the, at the point that's uh, the centroid of the angle. And if they meet outside of the cord, then that's the eccentricity that needs to be designed for. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, we appreciate you taking your time to spend with us this afternoon and uh, spend it with, uh, with us going over different, <clears throat> different things you could do for evaluating existing joists. Uh, what I'm gonna do uh, in the remaining portions of this webinar, we're gonna go over a couple of examples from the chapters one and two of the design, not the design guide, excuse me, of the technical digest. Uh, and take it from some of those examples, just point out a few things. Uh, go over the examples a little bit and then give you a little bit of information. Uh, our first example uh, is to kind of look at the reinforcement, what reinforcement or where reinforcement might be required in an existing joist. And for this example, we're going to grab and we're going to take uh, probably one of the uh, uh, joists used a lot, a 24K7. We're going to figure we have two 24K7 joists that are 40 feet long. And in this case, we're going to have to add two 500 pound uh, loads and those loads are going to be located at 10 feet and 15 feet from one end of the joist. We know and what we've done is from our uniform loads we looked and said well <clears throat> what is what design load do we need or what uniform lo total load do we need and that total load came up to be 250 PLF. So now I know is do we have to reinforce this joist and possibly where do we have to reinforce this joist. Well, we're going to look again. Let's take our original design again. We had original design, and from looking at going to the SGI load tables for the 24K7, if we look at 40 feet, we can see that the total load capacity of that joist was 253 PLF. So we know that that joist was designed at least for 253 PLF. Our actual condition below is a 250 PLF total load and a 500. At two 500 pound loads, one at 10 feet, one at 15 feet. So real quickly, a quick and dirty, fast way to do it, mate, real quick, just to see what's our condition, would be to draw a shear moment diagram of the entire joist. So this is a shear diagram of the 24K7, with the, of that 24K7 joist with, or our actual joist, with the 253 PLF load, which is the SJI load, which is shown by the solid line. And then the dotted line is our new joist with the 250 PLF load and the two 1500 pound loads. So we could see right away, we know that, well, the shears at the ends are higher than what our design shears were. So we're gonna have higher forces in the webs and in the center, we noticed our shears dropped a little. But remember, the SGI has long required that the, the minimum shear that any web needs to be designed for is no less than one quarter the maximum end reaction. So one quarter of the end reaction, in this case, would have been 1,265 pounds. So at that point, your shear diagram kind of levels off, then drops in the middle, and then crosses over. <clears throat> so you'd never have a, a shear or a, a, sh a web that had a shear less than 1,265 pounds. So we're all also going to look at what's our moment diagram look like. Those shears give us what's going to happen to the webs. 
the moment diagrams are going to give us our cord design because that moment's going to result in compression and tension forces in our cords. So we can see that by this, our actual moment uh, is a 56.4 kip feet. Our moment from our SJI <clears throat> 253 PLF load was 50.6 kip feet. So we're probably going to have some higher tension and compression forces in our cords. So with that, let's go find out what we need to do and what's, what those forces and those cords are going to end up. Well, we're able to get a diagram and we're able to figure out from our field investigation what the panel spacing is and able to set up our, a, a model of our joist so we can input it into a design program or whatever program we're going to use and model our joist, put our, enter our top cord members, our bottom cord members, and all our web members. And as Bruce mentioned, one of the things to remember is all of your web members are pin connected members. So model every, put your model in, make sure all your webs are pinned, apply your loads, and in this case, we're going to apply our 250 to 253 PLF load, and then the load from our new joist that we're trying to reanalyze, and get our forces, in, get our forces in those, in our cords. So from our analysis, we look at, we say our existing top cord, the review of that, we found out that our top cord segments, if we look, our 24K7, the axial forces in the top cord are given in that center column. The column in our right are the axial forces in the top cord from the new loads. And if you look, we notice that starting at member seven, we have exceeded what is the capacity, the, ma the maximum compression that occurred in our 24K7 with our original design load. So original design load, the maximum force was 20. 26, 429. We now have six top cord panels that exceed that. We're going to have to evaluate those six panels and see what type of reinforcement we're going to need in them. We take our analysis again, look at our bottom cord forces. If we look at that, we can see that in the middle panels, the maximum tension force was 26, 165. And our new forces now in panels three through five, we have three panels that exceed that maximum tension force that was used for the design of the 24K7. <clears throat> We're going to have to look at those members. Now we've got a web review. We had a very extensive web analysis. So if we look at it, all the webs have a higher force in them. It ended up having a higher axial force than the original design. And as we said, remember the minimum shear that was designed we had a minimum shear design. Remember, these are the forces in the webs, not the shears. So these are the actual forces in those web members. What's of a particular note is we added those two loads to the left side, and there was a stress reversal in web 10. What was a tension web is now a compression web. So there's a very good chance that that web is going to have to be reinforced. Other webs, they may be OK but we're going to have to check that web, especially that web, make sure it's okay. One of the other things to remember is make sure to check the actual weld lengths versus the required weld lengths. Okay, so okay. now we're gonna move on and take a look at some field repair issues. So we've un understood that we need to make some field repairs and we've told them to make field, re we've sent those field repairs out to them and we've asked them to reinforce webs or cords where needed. But what's very important is be very mindful of the workmanship and make sure that, that things don't occur or damages don't occur to the existing joist during these field modifications because you can weaken the joist. In this case, they were reinforcing an existing web and we had a little undercut in the top cord, or in the bottom cord, excuse me. So that's going to have to be repaired to make sure there's, there, we don't get any stress concentrations, possibly any problems with that bottom cord later. Uh, this was a particularly uh, poor repair where they added webs to the outside or added webs to the outsides of the joist and there were a lot of damages ended up being occurring. We had a little small, we had a small cut in the web. Don't know how they got this, possibly a grinder, 
uh, when they were maybe Charlie possibly grinding off, uh, grinding something off, and they cut into the web. We also had poor quality in the webs in the welds themselves. There could have been <clears throat> porosity, there could have been excessive undercut, but we just had poor quality in the weld. So be very make sure that any time of repair, any time you have repairs done, that they are inspected. And those repairs don't provide, don't cause any further damage to the joist. When you look at the actual member load carrying capacity, we're going to take. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that here. Make sure you evaluate the actual member in the field to see what the capacity is. What is the actual member's capacity? Because the joist, uh, joist manufacturers are going to use a member that's going to work for that particular load. That doesn't necessarily mean it's, it can't take more, but it could possibly take more, more force than, than what is its what you may calculate as. So it has a much larger capacity than the force than is the force applied to it. Uh, look at your conservative assumptions. What did you assume? What was this, uh, what were the were there any conservative assumptions made in the original design? Can you take a live possibly take a live load reduction? <clears throat> Evaluate the length and placement of the welds when you look at it. Where are the welds? As Bruce mentioned mentioned before, the welds are going to be in typical typically uh, in specific locations, but make sure you take a good look at where those weld lengths are and where they are. And determine the risk of repair versus its in-place capacity. Are you a little over? Use a little engineering judgment sometimes. Can you actually accept it? Are things a little bit, are they, is your final interaction ratio or your final overstress? Maybe it's close enough that you can do it. And remember the codes do allow for, uh, existing evaluation of existing members, there are some uh, stress increases you can take advantage of. So now we're going to take our first example and we're going to call it 1-1A. We're going to take our first joist, we're going to take that kind of that same joist and we're going to look at it and we're going to say, well, that 40-foot joist, we made some conservative assumptions, the engineer had some assumptions, we're going to say, all right, our original design load was 20 PSF, our original design dead load was 20, our live load was 30 PSF. The joists were five feet apart. So with that, our total uniform load was 250 PLF. <clears throat> we now have, we've gone in, we've looked at our loads, we've done a little, we've done, sharpened our pencils, found out that, well, our actual dead load is really only 15 PSF. We still have a 30 PSF design live load. So our total uniform load on that joist is 225 PLF. Now here's our original K series joist, that 24K7 with our total uniform load of 253. And now our new, our actual load is 225 PLF with our two 500 pound design loads. So we're gonna plug those loads that, that reduce 225 PLF load back into our design program and take a look at what happens there. So if we do that, We'll find, well, now by sharpening our pencils a little and taking out some of that conservatism, we find that we'll, we only now have four areas, <clears throat> four areas of the top cord, four segments of the top cord that are, exceed the capacity, the original design force in that top cord. Maybe not the capacity, but the design force. And remember, these are the actual design forces in the member, not necessarily the member capacity. When we look at the bottom cord, we only have two segments now that exceeded the force in the 24K7 joist. So those two have to evaluate it. Now those are only 3% greater than the actual design force. It may be possible that that bottom cord has that additional capacity and won't need any reinforcement. It may be okay. Remember, look for the capacity of that existing bottom cord member. Now, if we look at the web review again, again, several members do exceed that the do exceed the axial force in the original design, but you'll notice there are several members that don't exceed that capacity. We still have that design, that load reversal though in web 10. So we really have to make sure we still have that load reversal. And when you add new forces like that, new new forces on one end of a member or versus the other, 
you're probably going to see load reversal in one of those interior webs, especially toward the middle of the joist. So we're going to have to review all of those members in red, which cuts down what we have because before we were looking at every member, now we've cut it down considerably. <clears throat> So we're going to take an example. We're going to do a little bit different example. We're going to take that 1B example, extend it a little bit. Our, our first example, we're going to extend it a little further. We're going to use an alternate approach would be to check the manufactured joist using the actual design dead and live loads in place of the load capacity from the tables. Okay. For that review, we found the structural drawings and the joist spacing, in this case, was actually 6 feet. And the roof slope was 1 half 12. And we checked the roofing material, all that. We found that the roof, the weight was 15 PSF. Okay. We're going to look at, can we do a reduced live load? Okay. In this case, are we, we're going to go to IBC, look and say, look at IBC equation 1626. Can we reduce the live load? And our L0 is 20 PSF. R1 is, we're going to calculate R1 from those equations. Uh, we get 240 square feet. We can do reduce that. We can re allow to reduce it to 0.96. Our slope does not allow us a reduction to so our R2 is 1. So we plug those numbers in. We find out that we can use a reduced live load of 19.2 PSF times our 6-foot spacing. So we get a new live load of 115.2 PLF and a dead load of 90 PLF. So now here's our new design. Are, are more even where well, we've sharpened our pencil even more and gone in and look at it. So now we have 115 PLF total load with our two 500 pound loads again at 10 and 15 feet. So now we're going to plug those numbers in. And when we plug that in, we find out that in this case, all of our top cord forces are less than the maximum force in the 24K7 joist. So in this case, our top cord is acceptable. we look further, we look at a bottom cord review, taking that condition, we find that all of the forces now in the bottom cord members are less than the maximum force in our 24K7. So now all of our bottom cord panels are now acceptable. So that joist, by sharpening our pencils even more, we found out that our cords are actually okay. There's not a problem with them. We look at our webs again and we find that there are very few webs now that where the force is greater than the actual force in the 24K7 joist that was manufactured. So we see that webs 3, 4, 8, and 8R are all larger. And we're going to have to look at those, work, look, the, look at those joists specifically to see are there any problems with those? What is the actual capacity of those webs? to find out is there a problem. Note still, those, as we've, we found, Web 10 still has stress reversal. We've got to check that and evaluate that web for compression. The load might be less, but the, load, the magnitude of the load is less, but it's still, it is now in compression. We need to check that web in a compression situation. Now we're going to talk about a few things in Chapter 2 about methods for supporting additional loads. And Chapter 2 goes into providing different approaches you can take, different options you can look at <clears throat> and methods to support a joist before you start looking at strengthening a joist. We're going to look at one of those things is the capacity of the joist needs to be determined. Can the joist, we'll get it like, can the joist safely support the new loads? What are the actual loads on the joist? What are the actual load cases? Okay. Are stress ratios, interaction ratios, over 1.0 permitted? Current codes do allow uh, a do allow a increase of 5% in the stress, in the allowable stresses or your member or the original member capacities, which relate to a stress interaction of 1.05, where if you took the stress interaction, you could allow a five, a stress interaction ratios of 1.05. So we're going to look at different things. Make sure we look at these before we start looking at strengthening the joists that we have all of these items covered. 
couple things to make sure you're looking before you start looking at strengthening the joints in your analysis. Extensive reinforcement may not be practical. Okay, can you redistribute the load if you've already put? If you have expected to press the, or excuse me, if you have the load over two joists, and all of a sudden you're starting to reinforce those two joists, and it becomes you have a lot of reinforcement needed, can you spread that load out over three or possibly four joists and maybe reduce that load? So what we had is a 500-pound load where we had that load extended over two joists. If we can extend it over three or four joists, we can reduce that load and then possibly eliminate the need for any sort of reinforcement or the possibility of extensive reinforcements in the joists. Another option would be add a new joist or a beam adjacent to the existing joist to take those new loads. So if you can add a new joist or a beam to pick up those loads, that'll save you the option doing that. However, there are a lot of situ a lot of conditions that go into that. We'll discuss a few of those later on. So we're going to look at first load distribution. How can we transfer that load over three or four joists instead of just two? So first we've got to look at make sure our the new member we're adding has a suitable stiffness that it can distribute the load equally and that concentrated load can be spread equally to each joist. To look at that, we're going to have to look at the stiffness of the joist and the stiffness of that new beam. So that relative stiffness is defined by this equation, beta. And this equation is given as equation 2-1 in the design guide. And, and the variables are also given here. The first two, the numerator variables are based on the joist, the stiffness of the joist, and the spacing of the joist. The denominator EI are the modulus of elasticity for the beam and the moment of inertia of the beam. And beta is based on these variables. So in order to do that, we're going to have to go in and do that. We're going to do a quick example of that <clears throat> in a little bit. But in this, if your S, if the spacing of the joists is less than pi over 4 beta, then the spacing of the joists in inches, okay, then that spacing, if that spacing is not exceeded that limit, then we can use this approach. If the length of the beam we're using to, re to spread those loads out is less than 1 over beta, then the beam is rigid enough to where we can statically, we can use static equilibrium to distribute those loads. And in the case of our example, in the case of our previous example, what was it may be a 500 pound load at each point, we can now spread it out on four points and now we can divide that load over four places instead of two. So we're going to take a look, for example, we're going to follow an example in the design guide, example 2.1. It's we're using an underhung monorail beam to distribute the load between joists. So how can the load distribution eliminate the need for strengthening? We can do that by distributing that load and lowering the load per joist. And that way, by minimizing that load or decreasing that load and spreading it over more joists, we can possibly eliminate field modifications. This can eliminate strengthening, the need for reinforcements, <clears throat> doing that. The thing is, is now we've got to go, we're going to go over how can we design that beam or how do we design that beam to make sure we can distribute that beam between the joists. So in our example, we're going to say we've got a new monorail beam going under the bottom cords of four joists. The existing joists we have are 30 K-12s and they're 36 feet long. Our joist is spaced two foot six on center, and our monorail adds a total load of 1,200 pounds, and that load is 10 feet from the end of the joist. And that 10 feet is going to be important because it's going to come into the, it's going to be important knowing where that load is in that location because it's going to come into the calculation of our deflection, which goes to the stiffness calculation. So we want to be able to know where that is. So we're first going to determine the stiffness of the joist. Remember that our equation was the k value, the value k was the stiffness of the joist. So we can go and determine the approximate moment of inertia of that 30k joist. And we can use the equation that's given in SJI, the SJI tables. You can use determine that moment of inertia based on the live load and the length. 
And this equation that's given here is in the SGI specs. It's repeated again. L is the span minus 0.33 feet. So using our 30K joist, we've gone into the load tables. We find that the red load in the tables that will produce that deflection is, or in our case, our live load is 392, and our length is our length is uh, 36 minus 0.33, and we find that our moment of inertia, our approximate moment of inertia for our 30K12 is 476 inches to the fourth. So we have our moment of inertia. The SJ specs also note in there with that equation that to find the effective moment of inertia of the joist, divide by 1.15. This accounts for possible shear deformations, deformations between panels, small deformations that could occur in a truss. In a truss, so that moment of inertia, make sure you divide that by 1.15 to get the effective moment of inertia for the joist. Now, the stiffness is simply P over delta. So we can go to the manual, so everyone knows where to look up the equations for a simply supported beam with concentrated loads at points and that is just PA, B, P, A squared, B squared over 3EIL. So we can plug that into the equation for stiffness, rearrange the numbers, and we can come up with a stiffness for our joist of 11 kips per inch. Okay, and down the bottom, remember, A and B are the location of the load. So A was 26, we are, remember, our joist was 36 feet long, and the location of our load was 10 feet, so A is 26 and B is 10, or A is 10 and B is 26, however you want to approach it, it's going to be the same. Remember, we're using the effective moment of inertia is 414, and our, sex, our E is 29,000 29, KSI. So we plug that into the equation. We've got our stiffness. So now we know the stiffness of the joist. We know the spacing of the joist. We can determine our beta. <clears throat> and we're gonna use, we're gonna just try for the other example, we're just gonna try a W16 by 26 for our beam. Its moment of inertia is 301. So we're gonna plug those numbers in and we're gonna get a value of beta of 0.0101. We're going to check our spacing by plugging beta into the equation pi over 4 beta, and that comes up to 7.76. That is greater than the spacing of my joist, which is 30 inches, so we're okay. Our joists are going to be okay. The stiffness of that is going to be okay. Now we're going to look at the monorail beam. The length of our monorail beam is four times the spacing. No, three times is, is the length of our monorail beam is five feet. 60 inches, one over beta is 98. Actually, if you do this calculation, this comes out to be 99, not 98.9. I think there may be a rounding factor in here, but it, the beta is 99, but 99 is greater than 60 inches, the length of our beam, the length of our monorail beam support. So in that case, we're okay. So our beam is good for this application, and we can distribute the loads statically between the joists. So we can take 1,200 pounds divided by three, 400 pounds additional pound to each joist, we're okay. Now we could also look and say, well, if we were gonna distribute that load to four joists, could it be distributed to four? The answer is yes. Okay. In that case, you wanna distribute the four joists, the length of your beam would actually have been seven and a half feet. Oh, excuse me, the length of your, I think I said joist, the length of your beam would have been seven and a half feet. So make sure when you do the calcs too, that when you apply the load to the joist, include the weight of the beam. It could be an effect, it could be significant depending on the size of your beam. It could be a, add a significant amount to that load. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about reinforcing and replacing adding joists. Um, considerations or costs the time, engineering, and labor in the field, the difficulty of the repair, any interferences that might be there, make sure to look at those interferences, what can be, what can happen. 
uh, the effectiveness of reinforcing with relation to the skill of the workman is that's where we want to go with the effectiveness. As you, you've seen in the previous pictures, uh, if you don't have some skilled labor and you can have some problems, it can create, actually create more problems for the joist than what you starting with by re, uh, by what than what you started with. And always have a site inspector take a look at it if you can. Um, we make a habit of any repairs to make sure that a site inspector, someone is there to inspect the final repairs to make sure they're in accordance with what we've done. Uh, when you're considering reinforcing and replacing, also look out for existing interferences, especially if you're looking at reinforce either one, reinforcing or replacing or adding. Piping, electrical conduits, HVAC, uh, fire protection equipment, all those things could be in the way of either trying to reinforce a joist or replacing a joist. Or, or again, maybe even adding a joist in between. Camber in existing joists or cambering a joist. Uh, all joist manufacturers, unless specified in, in the drawings, joists are provided with some degree of camber. So if you're manufacturing or want to provide a new joist, you may want to reduce that camber or possibly even specify it with no camber. If you if you don't do that, that existing camber is going to make it difficult to re, to put a new joist in place uh, because camber has come out, dead loads are going to bring some of that camber out. So some of that roof is going to have, you're going to get some dead load deflections in, in those members. We always recommend if you're going to replace a joist or bring in a new joist, that you bring in a new joist, make it with no camber. Watch out the lateral stability of the top cord. You may need the existing joist do re, our lateral stability of the top cord in, in its relation to its compression capacity, that deck provides lateral support for the top cord. You can, if you're adding a new joist, you shot pins through the cord into the deck or through the, into the slab uh, if you have a concrete slab and, <clears throat> and provide that additional lateral support for the top cord. Uh, you can also rely on new bridging. If you put in new Bridging, that new bridging can provide lateral support. But if you're going to use bridging, relying on the existing bridging could be a problem because it, that existing bridging may not be designed for full lateral support of your top cord. You may, need, you may find that you have to evaluate that existing bridging and find out, is it going to be able to provide lateral support for the top cord? Again, when we mentioned camber, all joists are manufactured with camber. We'll talk a, lot, a little bit about it, a little bit more here. Uh, if you're replacing a joist, make sure you try to specify zero camber. It's always a good idea if you're going to add a joist to an existing situation, existing building, or or replace a joist that you specify that new joist with no camber. Again, the joists are manufactured with a small amount of camber. Uh, most or some of that camber is going to come out during dead load. So the existing roof may end up being for a, a flat system. So we always recommend you try to provide that with no camber. Another con thing to look at is when you provide the bearing seats, look at the existing bearing seats and what is their depth. The replacing joist, that new joist you want to replace it with, use a seat depth that's maybe a half or an inch less than the seat depth that's there. This is going to allow that joist to be set in place and then slide in into the supports or whatever support, either a beam or another joist, another girder that's there. It's going to allow that joist to be slid in under the deck and then you can raise the joist up to the deck by shimming the seat. If you're replacing a joist or adding a joist, what you might want to also consider is for ease of installation, use a bolted splice in the middle. If you use a bolted splice, it's much simpler to put the joist in because now you can in install each half of the joist and then bring them up into position and put everything together, bolt the splice together in the middle. And it's a lot easier to put that splice joist in than trying to jockey in a full length joist in, the, in, in, that, in that small area you're maybe trying to fit a joist. And if you only have joists at five or six feet apart, it can be a lot of work trying to jockey that joist in between the two. Where if you use a bolted splice and you're adding a joist, putting in a new joist, 
This makes it a lot simpler to put that new joist in. In reinforcing an existing joist, uh, consideration, some things that are going to impact that reinforcement are, is it if you have rod webs, you can easily add new webs on the outside of those angles. Uh, be careful though, the cords are typically thin angles, one eighth of an inch or less, in some cases on rod joists. So be very careful when welding to those. Uh, when you have crimped angle webs, again, crimped angles are, are always between the cords. So you can, again, you can add reinforcing webs on the outside of the cords. Uh, you can weld them to the vertical legs of the cords. So welding can be very, can be done very simply on those. But as I, you noticed in the previous examples in the pictures we show, you can also run into problems if they start bringing that weld too close to the toes of the existing cords. Uh, watch out for interferences too, because there may be interferences when you're trying to reinforce an existing cord. There could be, uh, there may be attachments to the top or bottom cords when you're trying to reinforce those cords. Uh, there may, again, if there are some items that could already be attached to them. <clears throat> so reinforcements on top cords or bottom cords, be careful about those, watch out for those interferences. Make sure you can get around them. For the larger joists, the LH series and girders, uh, if you're tr trying to add webs, one of the things Bruce mentioned, you can always add a web. If you've got a concentrated load that's not at a panel point, you're adding it. You may need to add a web to pick up that concentrated load. But if you have already have outside web members, it's going to be very, it's, in this case, it's impossible to get webs in between the existing members. So be careful about watching that, always adding a new joist at adding a new load. When you do this, try to always get that load at a panel point. If you can't, it means you may have to do some checking of the top cord for local bending. Things that are going to reinforce that are ex the <clears throat> how long ago was your building? How old is your building? What spec were they done? Recent specs and recent specs, all cords and webs uh, were used were 50 KSI steel. Prior to that, probably about 50 or maybe probably 20, 30 years ago, some joists may have used 30 KSI steel for, uh, for webs or possibly cords. So older joists and older systems, you're going to want to take a look. You may have to take a test coupon out of, the, out of a member, and there are places on a joist you can pull a member out, you can cut a small piece out and get a test coupon and check the yield strengths of the cords or webs. And there's a pretty good chance that that whatever was used for those cords is what was also used for the webs. For reinforcing existing joists, should you add, make sure to look at the webs, the existing web welds. All of those welds were designed, as Bruce had, may have mentioned, they were not, they may not have been designed for the full strength of the member. Recent specs do require that web members or welds, the weld connections be designed for 50% of the member capacity. <clears throat> so there is, there may be some additional capacity in those welds, but make sure you're checking what the length of those welds are and the size of those welds. Uh, watch out for any joint eccentricities. Bruce explained the eccentricities you should be looking for.